Welcome everybody. My name is Mina Jane and I'm the director of the Ashland Public Library and I'm really thrilled to be here with Louise Gray, who's going to be talking about her book Avocado Anxiety, Where Our Food Comes From. Um, I'm super excited about this conversation and I know you are too, but before we get to it, I just have a couple things to say. One is I'd like to thank the um, friends of the Ashland Public Library who support all of our programming. Uh, we could not do this without them. And I would also like to thank and welcome patrons from other libraries because Louise agreed to let us partner with uh, local libraries to um, make sure that she could talk to lots of communities in Massachusetts this morning. So um, quickly, I just want to say welcome to patrons from Ashland, of course, and then Lowell, Tewksbury, West Newbury, Andover, Linfield, Shrewsbury, Manchester, Rowley, Saugus, Danvers, Somerville, Hopkinton, Lexington, Marlboro, Maynard, Northampton, and Spencer. That's 17, not including Ashland. So it's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and People who have seen me before know that when I, I feel like when libraries get together to do stuff, we make magic. And this is a, a really interesting and important conversation. So we made magic today. Um, you can sign buy signed books from Louise from Bankscore Books. I will put that link in the chat. And, um, you know, again, if you know me, you know, I think signed books are gold. <laughs> So um, Louise is going to be paying attention to the chat, but we're also going to take questions in the Q&A after her short presentation. So without further ado, I'm going to say that Louise Gray is, is celebrating a book birthday for the Avocado Anxiety and other stories about where your food comes from. She's been a food editor and a food blogger and a food everything. She's gotten awards. Um, I could tell you so much more <laughs> Wait a minute. Um, about she wrote the book called The Ethical Carnivore about how she um, only ate meat of animals she actually killed. That was her, uh, the book before this one. This one is about where your food and vegetable, your fruits and vegetables come from, their origins, because sometimes we just don't know. So welcome, Louise. Thank you so much for being here. Please feel free to tell us more about yourself because I know my introductions are, eh. <laughs> welcome. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, it's the first state um, event I've done in the States. So um, it's really great. I'm really looking forward to people's reaction. Um, this is my book. <laughs> and it came out in the States um, this week. And um, I'm, I'm just gonna I'm gonna go straight to a, a short presentation, just so you've got an overview of the book. And usually it prompts quite a lot of questions. So then I hope with um we're all going to just have a really good discussion and um, try and find some answers. But I'm hoping that the book makes you less anxious, not more anxious. But you'll see um, um, if that's really the, the really, really the case. Um, so um, if everyone can see the screen there. Yep, it's great. Great. That's great. Um, I'm just seeing where. Uh, here we are. So um, as. As mentioned, my, my first book was The Ethical Carnivore, and I wrote that because I was aware that um, meat was a huge contributor to greenhouse gases. But actually, all food systems um, contribute. Um, more than one third of human made greenhouse gas emissions are from food production. And I've already answered the question about meat because I spent two years only eating animals I killed myself. And my conclusion from that was we should um, treat meat with respect, we should invest in welfare for animals and eat less meat. But then my question was, well, what about all the other things we eat? And I wanted to focus on fruits and vegetables because um, my great grandfather was a greengrocer. Um, it was a chain of greengrocers called Rankins in Edinburgh, in the capital of Scotland. And um, the, I was always brought up to be really proud of this heritage. And you can see on the screen there, that's um, the interior of an old fashioned greengrocer where you would go and you would um, um, make your order and it would be delivered to you at the till. Um, you know, there was no self-service. Um, the potatoes were at the back of the store in the mud. There was a big, you know, vat of beetroot bobbling away. It was a very different experience. And it was really interesting when I put those photos, you can, um, I'll, Put a, there's a link to my blog on my on social media but um, when I put the links up when I put those photos up lots of people remembered the green grocer and and missed it you know they missed the excitement of a coconut or um, dates which used to be quite exotic um, because now of course we all go to the green grocer and um, to the supermarket 
uh, to what Trader Joe's or Walmart. I don't know, you guys have big supermarkets as well. And um, when my great grandfather was trading, 20% um, of the market was supermarket with supermarkets and the 80% was you know in towns and now it's the other way around it's 80% of our food is bought at supermarkets and just 20% in the centre of towns and I'm sure even in places like Ashland and all the other libraries um joining in you know small shops have suffered a bit because of that but I think it's the reality so I was I'm I decided I was going to investigate where fruit and veg was that we bought at supermarkets you know not necessarily from farmers markets and things like that because that's very nice, but um, the majority of our food is coming from supermarkets. And I started with potatoes. And the thing about potatoes is it's the most intensive crop for our soil. Um, and in some areas of the world, the soil is so exhausted, we've only got 100 um, harvests left. And I don't know whether any of you have seen The Martian with Matt Damon. Um, and he grows potatoes um, on Mars and his famous line is, I'm going to science the shit out of this. Um, but actually they are growing potatoes in Peru um, on Martian like soil. And they say it's because they might need to grow potatoes on Mars, but really um, it might be because we have so little soil left on this planet. So we have to start looking after our soil. And that means cover crops, so not ploughing the land, but putting crops like phacelia that can put nitrogen back into the soil, um, drones to monitor the soil and, and only use chemicals where you need them and adding organic matter like, um, like our green waste from our gardens. So if we wanna carry on eating potatoes, we have to look after our soil. And the second thing, I, and the next thing I looked at was biodiversity. So climate change is a big concern, but so is biodiversity, I'm sure you all know about, um, we're in the sixth extinction uh, period, according to a lot of people. And biodiversity is um, being really impacted by um, our food. And in particular, well, in the UK, we've seen it in our birds. Our, since I was born, um, farmland birds have reduced by 50%. So things like skylarks and lapwings, you don't see them anymore because of how we farm. And I looked at how we might farm in a different way to bring to bring um, birds like nightingales back. And um, it means things like fetal banks and um, minimum um, minimum tillage again, you know, like leaving the land unplowed, putting ditches in for wildlife. And, and it doesn't necessarily mean that we can't have intensive agriculture because we've got to feed people, but we can do intensive agriculture and still leave um, strips for wildlife, but then we also need agroecological um, agriculture where where space is left for you know perhaps um, it's less intensive. You know you don't produce so much from the land, but you have wildlife. I'm sure there's wildlife in America that needs to be on farms as well, and to rewild areas. You know if we have intensive, we need to rewild areas, and it just shows how much our fruit and our veg and our food is connected to the wildlife we see around us. And the other thing I looked at was um, tomatoes. And that the reason I looked at that was a real concern is chemical use. We've really increased the amount of pesticides we use on all our fruit and vegetables. I'm sure you've all heard of the dirty dozen, um, trying to, you know, which are the 12 fruits and vegetables which have the most chemicals on them. And tomatoes are often up there, but tomatoes grown in greenhouses don't use any um, pesticides because um, in order to pollinate the tomatoes, you need bumblebees. So, of course, you can't have things that kill insects if you've got little bumblebees running around, um, well, <laughs> flying around. Um, so I went and visited greenhouses and there, there are increasing the number of greenhouses in the UK um, and certainly um, in the Netherlands. It's a huge industry. It's the second um, biggest fruit exporter after the US and for a tiny little country in Europe because they use these new technologies and they can be quite heavy on energy. But then the, we're starting to use renewables like ground source heat pumps and um, uh, anaerobic digesters to make sure the energy is green. And um, the next thing I looked at was where our food is from. So I'm sure you've all heard of food miles, how far has your food traveled? Um, I saw in the shops this week, asparagus from Peru in UK shops. But of course, this is a season 
when we grow asparagus in the UK, it's it's crazy. And in that case, you know, asparagus grown in Peru has got a very heavy carbon footprint because it's it's flown here. Um, and we have to think about where our food is from, Look, not, not buy so much air freight food. But at the same time, I was looking at the economic development opportunities in countries like Africa, in the UK. Uh, the UK government actually supports charities which are helping countries like Kenya to develop export horticulture because it, it's the quickest way out of poverty for a lot of people. And when you're looking at your carbon footprint, um, taking short haul flights or um, is a huge impact on the environment. Buying green beans from Kenya just isn't, it's a small amount. I think you need 420 packs for one return flight to Barcelona from the UK. And so if you've, if you've driven to the, to the supermarket in a four by four, it doesn't really make much difference. So it's a small proportion of your um, overall carbon footprint, though it is a big proportion of your shopping basket. So I'm not saying it's not important, but um, I do think in, but, but, but I've just tried to get a balance on that one on food miles, you know, like um, let's not stress too much about food miles when we're, you know, still um, struggling to, to, to shut down coal power, um, coal for power stations. And that links in with seasonality. Um, we all love to eat strawberries in season, and I do think they taste better. But certainly here in the UK, they're grown hydroponically. You can see behind me in that picture, they're all grown on tables and um, the, um, they're, they're fertilised with, um, there's drip irrigation and they're fertilised. It's all very controlled. So the amount of carbon isn't that different whether you eat them in April or September. And that's how long the season is now. So again, and kids love strawberries. I've got a kid. Um, it's not bad that we've extended the season, but we still need to keep our links to seasonality and growing because um, I think it just makes you happy. Like it, it tastes better. Like we lose connection with the landscape and, and wildlife and we lose connection with, with the seasons. Um, now the second thing, is, uh, I've said that food miles don't matter too much, food waste really matters. So I looked at carrots, wonky carrots, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with wonky carrots, we should be eating them, not throwing them away. So food waste is a massive issue. After meat, it's probably the biggest contributor, well it is the biggest contributor to greenhouse gases. Um, if food waste were, if the amount of greenhouse gases from food waste was coming from a country, it would be the biggest emitter after the US and China. So it's somewhere we can do a huge amount. And I looked into schemes where they've looked at trying to return us to what we're like in the Second World War, like frugality, you know, um, uh, trying to encourage people to, you know, eat differently um, and be more like, like our, our grandparents were during the Second World War. But I just, I don't think that's realistic. We're, we're, we're different now. And I'm suggesting we use apps like Olio and Nosh, Too Good To Go. And these are apps you can get on your phone. We've got them here in the UK. I, I recently got loads of hot cross buns for Easter because you can look in the app, you can see um, who's got excess and then go and share it. And it's a great way of um, um, saving waste. And I think a way of taking advantage of the of the opportunities we do have and something we should be using is a circular economy and that's the idea that you know instead of something being waste so um carrot carrot wonky carrots were sometimes in the past thrown away and now they're chopping them up and selling them as ready-made battens you know for people to snack on or as baby food um or beer from waste bread so there are lots of uh, lots of ways we can reduce waste and that's reducing land use which is better for the wildlife and environment and better for um uh, better for other people as well because there's more food um to to feed to people if we're not wasting it and in the uk surplus food is given to charities for people who are struggling which is a, a good thing when we've got too much but you know there are big questions on why are people hungry in a rich country like the uk and the us in the first place and I also talk about feeding the food to pigs, which is something being outlawed in the UK and lots of people think should be brought back in to, to stop food waste, which is such a big contributor to climate change. Um, I looked at bananas. Um, when I was writing about bananas, it was the height of the pandemic and it was quite chilling realizing that there's actually a pandemic in bananas. Um, most of the bananas we eat are Cavendish bananas. 
and they're all all the same and that means that when disease comes they all go and there is a disease it's called a uh, Panama disease and it's the fourth sort of um it's the fourth strain so it's called tropical race four and it's been found in South America and Central America where most of us in the US and the UK get our bananas um but looking to the history of bananas it's quite a dark history how um how we have cut down the rainforest to grow the bananas and um in the case of the US it's really a, an American story you know um had you know taken control of governments in order to use that land and grow the food cheaply and people still aren't paid enough really so you can look out for fair trade bananas and you can look out for organic bananas and the good thing about that is on those farms they're also farming in a more environmentally sustainable way so you know strips of wildlife between the rows of bananas um maybe less plants organic fertilizers and that actually helps with the disease because again if the soil's healthy it can fight back against disease everything comes back to the soil um and the, the the next thing i looked at was apples and that reflected i mean each chapter is a fruit or vegetable and an issue um and i believe you've got lovely apple varieties in massachusetts um but in the uk we only eat five varieties generally granny smith and Rayburn and jazz and um but we've got 2500 just in the uk i'm sure there's more in the us and realistically, we're not going to eat though. It's really convenient to have five varieties. And I'm always saying this book, eat more fruit and veg. It's good for you. But we have to keep these varieties alive because we keep the orchards alive, which are very special places for wildlife, for rare wildlife, um, lichens and birds. And because variety is so important um, for our own health, like variety in the gut microbiome um, keeps us healthy. And um, variety in nature helps us to... Uh, fight disease the bananas are a good example of that um and also climate change you know if we're going to need to grow apples in a warmer climate then uh, there might be apples out there that would be the best type so we've got to keep all these varieties alive in order to experiment and make sure we um make sure we keep keep them alive and returning to my first book again like if we're going to eat less meat we need to eat more plant protein and beans fava beans are amazing they're they're, they're not only um good for you because it's protein like we're all being told to eat a higher protein less carb diet and if it's plant protein it's just as good and then it's got less cholesterol in it so they're great for you but they're also great for the planet because they're legumes that fix nitrogen in the soil and they can be mixed into um uh, into different crops so you're getting that nitrogen into the soil and um, I do also address digestive issues with beans some studies done by NASA into that um, I'll let you read the book but um, but beans are another you know a vegetable that could help us um, eat in a more environmentally sustainable way um, and of course one thing that we can all do is grow our own at the beginning of the book I was like oh I'm gonna this is gonna be the story of how I um learn how to grow my own fruit and vegetables but of course I was I mean I was okay I grew, grew a few but you know you need a lot of experience a lot of time mindfulness something I struggle with so I did grow a bit of fruit and veg um but what really came out of that for me is not that we're going to be able to live off our own fruit and veg I mean maybe some people but you know um it's pretty challenging there's the mental health benefits it really helped me to go there and relax at the garden, see the wildlife and the nature. And there's lots of new studies coming out finding that gardening can really help people. Um, and I looked at uh, ones which, are, you know, it shows just looking at the shapes, uh, soft attention, the way we garden, all these things can help us. And I visited hospitals where they're using gardening to help people with mental health issues. And um, I also spoke to a NASA scientist again, who took a courgette into space. And he, that wasn't a scientific experiment. He did that for his own sanity. And then it was such an interesting story because um, the other scientists then would like do hoovering for him in order just to have their nose next to this courgette in space. And I think it just shows that we, we somehow need plants and green things around us. So it's important that we um, maybe set aside more green space for, for nature and for plants. And uh, going back to food miles, we could be, uh, we could be growing a lot more in cities and it's good for kids to learn. It's good for um, the um, air quality in our cities. Um, 
and 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 good for our mental health just to see green around us and good for our health i mean it might not it's not going to supply all our fruit and veg but we could be growing a lot more in cities and google's done a study saying we could be growing up to 10 percent with using roofs and vertical farms and things like that um this is i had a baby during the writing of the book <laughs> um but this is on a vertical farm um and what the future might look like we are going to be growing more indoors using leds um but i don't think it's ever going to be a huge amount most of our growing will still be on farms outside of cities so it's getting that balance i think um and the final chapter is about avocados got my avocado earrings on um and the, the first question I think is avocados often come up when I wrote my first book, people would say, you know, well, look at these vegans eating avocados, you know, that's much worse than a beef burger. And um, well, it's it's not in terms of carbon. Um, a carbon footprint of an avocado is 1.6 kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent per kilogram. And I have that uh, figure for all the fruit and veg I talk about in my book. Um, because that's something I think we're going to get all, we're all going to be talking about a lot more in the future as we begin to understand our carbon footprint and try and reduce it. Um, so they're not, they're not that, they don't have bad carbon footprint avocados, um, but they do use up a lot of water, for, water, 85 litres per avocado. And that's a problem in countries like Chile, where they're using up um, water sources, which they share with um, villages and people. So that's a big issue. And in the UK, we get most of our avocados from Peru, where water is probably the main issue. In the US, I understand it's Mexico, where it's about human rights um, and um, avocados, avocado farms being, being, being targeted by organized crime. I don't think that means you should um, boycott avocados because then the people working on this farm still don't have an income. Um, but fair trade avocados are available in the US. It's something that's coming forward more. So people are getting worried about eating avocados. But in the book, my main argument is not to worry because um, it's still it's still a really healthy food. It's still like there are definitely improvements that can be made, but they are getting better on water and things like drip irrigation. And we need to be less anxious about our food eating disorders are on the rise and just more knowledgeable, I think, um, understanding where it's from, which is what I've tried to tell the story in the book. And I've tried to give people a few answers, always eat more fruit and veg, buy fair trade banana, um, bananas, eat more plant protein, um, grow your own food and forage. There's a bit of a list here, but we can go over more, um, cut down on your food miles, um, reduce your food waste, but most of all, um, don't be too anxious. <laughs> I hope I haven't made you anxious and I'll, um, I'll stop the, um, I'll stop the screen share there and, um, and come back into talking to Mina. Thanks a lot, everyone. Uh, it was really fascinating. Um, so I want to say, use the chat to like sort of crowd share information, but put your questions in the Q&A and I will moderate them to Louise. Um, I have to say, as a librarian who has book earrings, not wearing today, I love that you have avocado earrings. <laughs> <laughs> They're from the US. They're from San Diego. Someone sent them to me from San Diego, which is very sweet. <laughs> that is awesome. Um, so I did want to say you had mentioned the apps for um, buying vegetables and locally. Um, and actually, somebody just asked if you could put the last screen up of the list so they can... Um, Sure. I mean, oh, okay. Yeah. Do you want me to do that now or should I just do it when we finish chatting? Um, yeah, why don't you wait uh, until we're almost done and then um, okay. I, I can also take a screenshot of it or you can send it to me and I can send it yeah, to you. Yeah, I could maybe even put it up on social media so people can look at it. Yeah. Yeah, that would be great. Um, so the in in our area, I know there's a thing called Misfits Market where you can buy ugly vegetables um, oh, I'm nice. not, yeah, so I'm not really sure like what the carbon footprint of that is because I don't know if the markets are local and they're just trying to get rid of ugly vegetables, but, um, I think it's something that I'm, I've looked into and I probably will do at some point. Um, cause I think reducing food, food waste is always, um, always a good thing because it, you know, when you look at a big company, it might not be a massive amount of carbon, but, um, but you know, just, it, it just makes sense, doesn't it? If a fruit it's taken energy to grow and that vegetable 
And so if it's used, it's always better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I read somewhere that um, it might have been even been in your book that in the US, at least 40% of food gets wasted. Yeah, yeah. And, it's really and a lot of it is in the home and we're always attacking green grocers and things. I mean, um, supermarkets, but a lot of it is just us at home. Yeah, I, yes. <laughs> so um, I'm really interested in um, your combination of science and chemistry with techno the technology of growing yeah. food. And I, it sounds like we really need to be much more aware of um you know, what, it, what impacts our soil, what is, uh, what pesticides can be used and things like that. Where's the best information for us to learn about those kind of things? Um, about where we should be buying our fruit and vegetables? Um, no, just how, uh, what affects our fruits and vegetables negatively and our environment, like the soil you said. Um, yeah, yeah, like, well, I think, um I've tried to put it in the um put it in the book but I think um it, it is about farming methods mm -hmm. and a lot of people would say organic but organic is is more is is more costly and it's not necessarily accessible to everybody so um and then in the UK we have things like regenerative agroecological um biodynamic I'm sure you have loads of labels on your food right um but I think it's really confusing for people to have to expect to shop by a label to be looking out for something. I feel like all farming should be looking after the soil or we're all in, all in trouble. So I think a really good way is just to try and make connections with the farm. I know there's a farmer's market in Ashland, right? Yeah. yeah so like just making connections with farmers and um, um, trying to buy locally because then you can, then you can have some influence mm -hmm. and then, you know the, the the supermarkets are making ma are making an effort you know so we can reduce you know, you know so um um but, but what farming methods they're using i don't know like i think organic's good but i think um just seasonal and local where you can i think it's probably the only was the only label i talk about yeah i completely agree I, we were talking about this before we got started was that um you know, I love mangoes and mangoes are only good at certain seasons and, but we get them all year round. So we often only buy them in, when they're supposed to be in season. Um, so anyways, they're, only, they're, they're actually like, um, I was doing with my Pakistani friend last night and they're not, they're in season in June in the summer, actually mm -hmm. they're at their best and that's when they taste their best. And that's when you get different types of mango. And I really love that because you think seasonality is just about the fruit in your country, but it's not, you can think about, seasonality in other countries and that's um I still think that's a lovely thing to connect to the season in another country even if you're not living there especially perhaps if you're um away from your home country mm -hmm. yes definitely um Lisa asks do you recommend washing fruits and vegetables with special products or just water just water I'm afraid because I did look into this um so the dirty dozen is really well known and the, the concern with the dirty dozen is that um, so all the fruits and vegetables are tested by um, uh, for the amounts of pesticides on them, and it's all deemed to be safe by government agencies in the UK and the US. But what the um, charity, what 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 uh, pesticides a action network and the US um, um, organisations say is that the combination of these pesticides is still dangerous, and there hasn't been enough studies done into it. But as a writer, I don't have the peer reviewed science on that. And so I think I, where, where, where there is science is eat more fruit and veg. So um, I think, you know, wash it if you're um, concerned about it. But I think, yeah, concentrate on the science telling you to eat more fruit and veg because there's loads and loads of evidence on that. And um, um, for me, I haven't found the peer reviewed science yet on um pesticides on our fruit and vegetables that we buy commercially so i can't um so i would just wash them with water if you're worried but try not to worry and just eat loads of fruit and veg okay less anxiety i like that 
Um, so I do want to say uh, that you responded to Tracy's comment about her great grands being greengrocers and the pickle barrel, but you responded to just you and me, the host. And oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> so okay, okay. you can uh, basically, Tracy, she said, bring back the pickle barrel. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and I've seen a question saying which of the dirty dozen. It's updated every year. Um, it's updated by, um, um, I'll try and put a link up, but I'm, um, by, uh, it's a pesticide action network in the UK, and I don't know what they're called. There's something similar in the US, but it's updated every year. Okay, I can probably- But there's a lot of, it's contested, you know? Lots of people would say it's um, not, it, 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 it puts people off those fruit and vegetables and that's more damaging. Mm. Um, Stephen asks, is there any local, any organization or company doing worm farms or other creatures in bulk that could be distributed to farms to help the soil? Not worm farms, but there are like um, companies um, that are going in and they, um, they will, if not necessarily worms, but it's bacteria in the soil. So they, um, there's, there's a whole movement of farmers who are trying to, it's not organic farming, but they, 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 they basically they train the farmers um, in how to um, look for the creepy crawlies in their soil, the right the right bacteria. And she's called Dr. Eleanor. Mm, I'll, I need to look that up for you. But there are and it's huge in the US and they, they, they want them to bring worms back to their farm, but not by introducing worms, by getting the farmers to use microscopes to understand what's in their what's in the soil already and then to introduce, you know, um, organic matter or maybe some um, uh, manure or maybe some um, um, you, you know just compost or it could be could be soil from another area and see if they can kick start and get the bacteria going again in the soil because that's what makes healthy soil so they are in a manner of speaking trying to bring worms back to farms yes because that's healthy soil mm -hmm. we actually had a program last week with um, I told you Sarah Robertson Barnes who uh, talked about uh, sustainability with kids and she actually had a worm thing in her house for uh, composting yeah a wormery yeah. yeah yeah they're they're, they're, they're amazing like um I talk about worms in the book because Charles Darwin his book about worms actually sold more than um, his book about natural selection yeah. and um, he um th that was one of his lifelong passions was watching worms and realizing how important they are and you can you know it's a great indicator of um soil health and this book that chapter I wrote tens of thousands of words and I had to cut it down but it's really all about work it's just everything comes down to soil <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah I um I thought that was really funny and I think it would really change Macbeth if it was like get thee to a no it's Othello get thee to a wormery as yeah yeah <laughs> Great. They're really great places. Yes. <laughs> Very different though. So Tracy yeah. says, are you, so are you aren't advocating abstinence of foods with more air travel miles than average than the average one? Would you advocate being a local vor? Where yeah. I mean, I would advocate being a local vor, but the point is it's not um um the hundred hundred mile diet was big in the US a few years ago, and we had something similar in the UK. And I spoke to the guy who did that. And it's a really good thing. And he's advocating 80-20. So 8% of your fruit and veg of your food comes from um, locally, which is actually harder than you think. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, you can get 20% like your tea, your coffee from further afield. Um, and I think it's really great because it connects you to the seasons. You know, you maybe go and um, talk to the local farmers, you um, um, and it can be healthy. So I'd say for that reason, and 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 local farms mean more diversity. It's good for the environment, but not necessarily for carbon, actually, because of because of, I mean, a little bit possibly, but because of the bulk, you know, the bulk that we we transport fruit and veg in, there isn't actually a huge carbon footprint sometimes from transport. So, and I also think it's a bit of a feminist thing, like you know. Um, being a local for takes time you know you can't run back and just give your kids some frozen peas and some pasta if you're being really um, purist about it and I don't know about you but I would struggle with that because mm -hmm. I'm working and um, so I, I think uh, the book um, I'm not making excuses I'm just being realistic so I think it's great to be a local for but um, 
um, it doesn't. I don't think you need to be purist about it because you know we do we do need to have less air freight certainly but it's not um I think in terms of if you're going to worry about carbon you know we need to worry much more about air travel and um and you know our energy and transport mm -hmm. and I think that your comment about being realistic is the important one is that we have to do what's right for us in the moment and yeah that change I, I know in Massachusetts, we are actually very lucky to have a lot of um, community farms, CSA, so yeah. we, we can pick it up once a week. I think I told you I've gone to meet, I've actually ordered meat shares where it's a local farm. Um, yeah, so like there are opportunities in our area. I don't know if it's all over the country, but I have loved having shares and yeah. um, getting the fresh local farm and supporting a fresh local farm. Yeah, yeah. It's a great way to, it's a great way to do it. Like here we have veg boxes, similar thing. Mm, oh, interesting. So Lisa asks, what do the pigs eat in the UK if it is illegal to feed them veg scraps? Well, sometimes they eat soy, which is obviously a big problem. They're eating GM soy. Oh, that's not So, it, you know, it'd be much better if they were eating slop, you know, um, uh, waste fruit and veg. That's one of the arguments that we should be doing, yeah. Okay. And Nancy says, what are your thoughts on frozen vegetables? They're not easy to trace where they come from or when they were picked. Yeah, I mean, they are good for you nutritionally. So, and they can be a good way of like, you know, you can only get green beans for quite a short time in the UK, but they can be frozen. So um, I think I think they're generally a good thing because they're a way of, um, in the UK anyway, like most the frozen veg I use most is peas mm -hmm. obviously a legume <laughs> so it's really good for you it's got protein um it tastes good it's nutritional and it can be UK based so I'm I I, I eat probably quite a lot of frozen veg yes yeah, so I think it's a good thing mm -hmm. uh, is it as healthy for you though as yes yes it's as, uh, arguably healthier because um if it's been frozen straight straight from the field it can be fresher mm -hmm. and do you think that it is um T uh, taking away from food wastage if they're able to freeze something as yeah well yeah you can you 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 waste less so one of the ways to waste less bread is to keep it in the freezer you know like it's definitely a way of yeah it's another good point it can reduce food waste mm -hmm. and uh, another question related to that of mine is what about canned vegetables are those um yeah I think for the same reason yeah like less waste and um um it's a good way like if you are going to argue to be uh, more seasonal you know you need to you need to eat canned veg out of season don't you because you don't you can't get fresh so um yeah I think there's nothing wrong with canned veg I just wonder about the what they put in it like um to... yeah I don't know about that I don't know about that but I think like canning is quite a um a, you know um you know you can tomatoes like yourself you don't need any any preservatives so I mean actually canned tomatoes often come from China interestingly um they can come from China and quite far away so look on the label um because they're not they're using more chemicals there but um uh yeah I don't think again I think I think it's a good way to eat yeah it's all getting more fruit and veg into your diet and um and enabling you to eat I think if you weren't if you weren't eating canned vegetables, then it'd be quite hard in Scotland, at least, to eat vegetables. You know, in the middle of winter. Mm -hmm. So true. Mm -hmm. um, Stephen says farms use animal manure for fertilizer. Is it okay to use human manure, or is that dangerous or just unappealing? Well, we are we are doing it in the UK, and it, it's treated and it can be used as fertilizer. Yeah, and it's a um, the issue is the um, amount of um, well, some people worried about the hormones, but also about um, the heavy metals in human sewage because of um, what we're eating and ingesting around us. So there is concern about that. I mean, it used to be a lot more straightforward. It was called night, night soil. My grandfather was a farmer, my great grandfather. And, you know, night, you'd, he was near Edinburgh. So he'd be putting night soil on the um, on the fields, human manure. And um my dad does now mm -hmm. <laughs> on potatoes, but it's obviously been very treated. Mm -hmm. But I think um, technology is helping us to use that. It seems to me a good thing. I mean, I'm I'm not too squeamish about it. I'm like, you know, if the, you know, it's all going back into the soil, it's good. Mm -hmm. So is that something that um, 
that it could be like one of those circular things where you get the soup. Yeah, absolutely, and absolutely. And um, you can, uh, there's um, Eleanor MacArthur, is a, she, she sailed around the world in record time and she's a great advocate of the circular economy. And that's exactly it. Like um, a linear economy is just, you know, we have something, we eat it, we throw it away and, and, but we're going to run out. <laughs> so you have to, if, if you're, if you're bringing back into the, you know, I suppose, yeah, like human manure can be part of that, you know, it's going back into fertilizing the soil so we can grow more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they do that in lots of countries, like, you know, I mean, but interestingly, um, vegan farming, you know, uh, veganic farming um, wouldn't use animal manure, you know, because they, they want to take the animal out of the, out of the system completely and um they use different kinds of compost like they argue you don't need um manures animal manure so um i don't know what they think about human manure that'd be an interesting one but yeah um karen asks do hot house vegetables contain less nutrients the thing about nutrients is usually the soil and it's a really hard thing to study because there's been lots of studies like are organic foods, uh, vegetables, more nutritious, but it tends to be based on the soil it's grown on. So it's very hard to do a do an experiment where you've got two two um, plants grown in the same conditions uh, next to each other, but using the same soil. Um, so uh, there have been studies that found organic milk and dairy and meat is can be more nutritious it can have more omega-3 in it mm -hmm. um but not vegetables and fruits as far as i'm aware mm -hmm. and what's more nutritious uh is if you eat fruits and vegetables raw or if you cook them or is there a... it, it can it can, be, it can be depend like with the um to get back to the hot house question i mean um tomorrow um no, they're not. I don't think they are less nutritious. I think a tomato is still really good for you if it's come from a hot house. Um, and um, sorry, what was your question, Mina? You know about about um, if 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 it takes away from nutrients if you cook fruits and vegetables. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm not a nutritionist, but I I know you know you shouldn't like overboil things and things like that. But then there are fruit and veg like you know uh, if you bring legumes into it which can be it can be better for you if you cook them you know because it makes it easier to digest mm -hmm. oh yeah lisa says what about microplastics in the food system how do we minimize that <gasps> oh yeah like well i mean that goes back to the sewage question that's another part of using human sewage we we, we get rid of microplastics mm -hmm. um but definitely in the in the uk um there's recently been a drive to reduce the amount of um, plastic in, for containers for fruit and, fruits and vegetables. So we, we have more of them loose, um, which means that he, we have to bring, you know, containers to the, sh well, we have to bring bags to the shop rather than expecting them to be um, in plastic. And then that, that will reduce it, but you also, um, things like cucumbers, there's less food waste if they come in plastic, but they're looking at things like uh, Bill Gates, you know, the um, entrepreneur, well, you know, um software giant he he's he's supported something called a micro um a, a peel which is um a plastic made out of biodegradable material for mm -hmm. things like cucumbers so maybe that would help to get more plastic out of the um out of the food chain and i wasn't aware of that much in it but i guess yeah it's getting into the soil it is it's everywhere it's in the um, and you were saying the food chain, not just fruit and veg, well, it's getting to our fish, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So I guess we have to think about how we have less of it. And like, there's really interesting stuff on, uh, you can put filters on your washing machine. Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's, um, I guess it starts with um, with us, on uh, us not producing so much microplastic, yeah. Right. We were, we're actually having that conversation in the library about if we should continue to cover books with plastic. It gives the book more life so more people can check it out. So you're not buying a new book every time the cover rips or whatever. But on the other hand, we cover thousands of books a year in plastic. Yeah, but I think that um, I do think I do think, you know, using it again is the better thing. Definitely on, uh, on balance. There. We, we talk a lot about we worry a lot about things like plastics, but we're not asking questions about, I don't know, um, we're not asking questions about going on short haul flights or, you mm -hmm. know, bigger issues. 
Right. I guess everybody's thinking about how they can make some sort of impact on these questions. Um, Susan says that they found microplastics in mother's milk. I, yeah, that's really sad. Yeah. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Actually, so. this is an interesting question from Miriam. In your research, did you find anything specific to Trader Joe's practices? Are their fruits and veggies good for us in terms of fair trade? I I um I didn't look at US um US stores um I didn't actually look at UK stores other I well I did I did as a whole you know and um I mean and and supermarkets there's definitely um ones which are better than others at specific times mm -hmm. but then they can change and I think that's really confusing for the consumer so as I as a writer say oh you know Trader Joe's great or Trader Joe's bad it might if, it might even change by the time you're reading the book so I'm what I'm trying to do is give you the the skills to um um to to ask for yourself to look for things and I, that's why I think and it's only really things I really trust like fair trade like fair trade's definitely got its problems especially for um not so much for bananas but other things but I think it's still something worth investing in because it it's um uh, a very well respected label now it's been around for a long time and I think we should just support it you know so I think there are things that I would um, and organic as well and we have something called leaf which is um, linking environment and farming in the UK but there are relatively few labels which are really sort of stand by because um, that they can change over time Mm -hmm. Another one is Marine Stewardship Council, which is a good one to look on out on fish. But lots of people in the environment world question it. But I sort of think like consumers need help with decisions, but you can't overload people. Mm -hmm. um, but I think your original point about, you know, like seasonal, seasonal, like if you can get a veg box or a CSA, that's a really, that's really great. But then going to Trader Joe's for fruit and veg, like, um, if you're eating less meat and you're eating more fruit and veg, you're doing pretty well. So yeah, it's all about balance and yeah, doing, yeah, doing what is as we said realistic yeah. for you. Yeah, and it's much less. It's a difficult one because I can't. I'm, ne I'm never going to tell people to eat less fruit and veg because um, the the world it it really does in the UK, certainly in the US, I think as well. You know, more horticulture, especially more lo local horticulture, growing vegetables. Um, eating more vegetables like getting more into our diet is so good for our health but it's really good for our environment as well because it brings in diversity and connection um, with the land um, just color life vibrancy you know we can get pretty passionate about vegetables <laughs> <laughs> I love it <laughs> I like Zoe's uh, answer to my thing about book covers too and it's really just a, like I said we're all thinking how can we individually affect this because there's corporate things that we can't necessarily affect without serious activism and so we yeah. like on a on a local level we're all every I think most people who care about climate and that this stuff are thinking what can we do to have some sort of impact at least locally um so Stephen says I wonder if climate change is opening up more tillable land like maybe Siberia <laughs> yeah, I mean um it, 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 it is when you look at um there are certainly areas of the world and mostly in the northern hemisphere where uh, we will be able to grow more food because of climate change um and and you can look at it and think oh well that's okay then mm -hmm. <laughs> but then there are very populated areas of the world where you're going to be growing less mm -hmm. so um i'm not sure balance is out and also you have to think about like we might be able to grow more food but wildlife and biodiversity can't change as fast so we're losing no one really knows the impact that will have so we're going back to soil again you know like we might be able to grow more food but um will the will the condition of the soil really suffer when because the soil the micro the the bacteria in the soil can that change fast enough mm -hmm. so yeah there are going to be areas of the world i mean so it'd be, already in britain we're growing more more grapes in England, mm -hmm. because more wine in England, um, and um, even fruit, fruits and vegetables, and um, avocado trees in London. Apparently, because it's going to be the, like the tropics, so we are going to be able to grow more in certain parts of the world. Yeah, yeah. Well, is um, there is there an issue with infrastructure with that? Like, I mean, how long does it take for a community to switch over from, you know, growing nothing to growing grapes? Well, and yeah, I mean, 
they, these things can happen quite fast. You know, if a company is going to make money, it can happen quite fast. And I was talking to avocado producers recently, and they were saying in lots of areas of the world, like Peru, like up oh, Colombia, they they've start there. They they've got like the fastest growing avocado industry, and people are making money because there's big demand for avocados mm -hmm. and that's huge infrastructure being put in place but then there's coming with that jobs and money so it it can happen fast and isn't necessarily a bad thing mm -hmm. but what about the issue of water because water has become such an issue because one one it's been polluted in many places and two with climate change there's droughts in in our sort of like uh growing belts um how is that sustainable well, it's not really. I mean, in the UK, our government actually went and there's a um, university, well, it's commissioned reports that have said we can't, we're getting 85% of our fruit from other countries and we're kind of importing their water. Mm -hmm. And some of them don't have enough water. So we have to start growing our own fruit and vegetables here. Well, we've got plenty of water. And if you are going to grow it from other countries, make sure it's sustainable. And there are definitely, there are huge changes they can make in drip irrigation and you know using and avocados grown in places like Chile maybe that wasn't such a sensible idea because it's a desert mm -hmm. and 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 it's a really great climate well the the, the heat and the sunshine is great but there isn't the water mm -hmm. um so uh yeah that like I think water is something we maybe got to take more responsibility for um because yeah we're 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 taking it from other places and while we've got the money we can take it but when as soon as another country like China in particular and Asia when they've got more money they'll take that and then we won't we won't have access to those things so if, unless we're growing the fruit and veg with our own water we're going to be in trouble mm -hmm. um can you speak to GMOs at all yeah totally like so like you you have G genetically modified fruit and veg in the in the US so mm -hmm. you're all eating all your papayas are GM right mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah um there's many I'm interested to know what people think of that because in the UK people are terrified of GM the European um uh you the European um government have 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 banned it for really for consumption but what most people don't know is because gm soy is so ubiquitous um we eat it in the uk so we get we still get reese's peanut butter cups mm -hmm. we're not in many shops but if you want to buy them and then if you look at the small print it'll say gm soy you know so we do get it here um but we don't have any gm fruit and veg and um we are, but we have scientists who are developing it, purple tomatoes, mm -hmm. purple tomato juice, which I think they're gonna sell in the US because the UK is a bit behind on that. And I personally wouldn't be frightened of eating it. Like I've already eaten it probably in GM soy, but I am very cautious of the impact it's having on the environment. And um, bananas is a good example. So they already have a GM banana that's resistant to pa Panama disease. Mm -hmm. which would solve the problem but then what do you do when that banana gets panama disease you, you, you the nature already has the answer and if you had more diversity then the disease wouldn't spread so quickly so i don't know i'm people who are pro gmo and i've interviewed scientists who spent their whole lives looking into gmo to like feed people to like stop poverty they're good people um but i'm I'm still on the fence about it. Like I, I, I would, I wouldn't worry too much about eating it, but I'm not sure about um, how, how. Um, I, I don't know. I, I just think couldn't, couldn't we use other? Couldn't we use the science we already have? We have the the food system is in such a mess. This whole book's about all the things we could be doing, and I think we need to do those first before we do GMOs. But then you guys wouldn't have papayas, I guess. But then maybe. But then maybe you can't have papayas if you grow them like they were like they've been grown. I, I don't know. Like, what are, are there other GM foods like may and corn? I guess that you eat. Um, that I'm not sure of. But yeah, I think... you know, a lot of corn is GM in the US. Yeah, there were I'm... tomatoes, but they didn't last long. Um, I don't know. Well, I mean, isn't that part of the issue that 
we're kind of spoiled. Like we expect to be able to get all these things at any time, you know, on the, at the drop of a hat. And we really don't necessarily, I like papayas, but I wouldn't die if I didn't have one, you know? So like, I guess I think like, do, do we have to change our habits in, in that sense too, of not expecting to find every vegetable and fruit at the store at any time of the day or night? That's a really good question, but I don't think it's going to change. I think it's too, it's too far gone. So um, I think, I think it's about um, tweaking the food system. There's a lot we can do, like, so school, school dinners, hospital food, like all the, all the state food could be much more healthy. And Mm -hmm. um, there's a, you know, it's not just about our, um, you know, the US and the UK have huge problems with obesity um we shouldn't even possibly because um of our food environment it's not like in the 50 years we've all suddenly lost our self-control it's because we go into a shop and and that's what the cheap food is Mm -hmm. so we need to change our food system but I don't think we're going to be going back to um all seasonal and local but we could be going to where seasonal is available and more food you know we we just know how to we're eating better. Mm-hmm. That totally makes sense. Yeah. Um, Lauren says, <laughs> we're going back to human manure is treated. Yes. Can you give a little more detail about what that means? What does that mean to be treated? I think, I think it's basically heated up so that they get so it's safe. So it's okay. safe. It's not smelly. It, I've seen it. It's in pellets, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like a fertilizer, but it's like pellets, like, um, you know, just brown pellets that are odorless. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, a lot of the fields that are spread on are near people's homes you can't it has to be treated so yeah I mean I'm sure it must be happening in the U.S. I'm sure Hmm. absolutely um so Catherine who had to leave a minute ago um did put a link for the dirty dozen on in both the chats for Q&A and since we just have a couple more minutes I was wondering if you wouldn't mind putting your slide that last slide up again yes absolutely yeah 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 um the meantime if you all want to let us know what you've thought about this program. I will let you know, I'll send out the video link in the next couple of days, as well as um, any resources that Louise has to share with us. So this was the last slide about her suggestions of how to how to be a little bit more <laughs> on top of I've got, I've got recipes in my book, things you can try. Um, and um, and I've got a, a, a social media at Lou B. Gray, L-O-U-B-G-R-A-Y. Um, and I'm really happy to take people's questions and to um, and and to carry on the conversation there. Yes, that's right. So we're gonna I'm gonna post the video also to um, Louise's um, Twitter account and Instagram account, so you can continue a conversation there if you have any additional questions. So thank you so much for being here, Louise. This has been fabulous. Just really everything. great questions. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> yes, and good luck with your tour and. I forgot to say happy Earth Day. Today's yeah, uh, happy Earth Day to world. everyone. Yeah, it's great <laughs> to talk about food on Earth Day because it's such a such a key thing. Well, it's a perfect tie-in. So thank yeah. you. And go out, everybody here, go plant a tree, an avocado yes. tree or something. Yes. You can. <laughs> Have a great day, everyone. Thank, thank you, Louise. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.